Well, welcome to uh, NanoStrings GeoCast event. This event is really a celebration of two things. We're very excited about the spatial biology area in terms of how we're discovering new markers every day based on the technologies that are being coming available. But we're also excited about the launch of the Geomix Digital Spatial Profiler. And so today what we're going to do is talk about two different studies that look at the applications of the Geomix Digital Spatial Profiler and how they enable you to discover a new brand of spatial biomarkers. Um, before we bring on the, the first speaker and the second speaker, I wanted to give you a little background on what the technology can do and what's unique about it. The, the first part about the technology that's unique is that it's really designed for translational studies. How do I discover biomarkers in an analyte agnostic way, so RNA and protein? How do I start to look at really tough tissues like FFPE? And then how do I do this in a way that's relatively high throughput, 10 to 20 samples at a time, so I can really do high powered studies? And that's the way that I'm likely to increase the probability I'm going to discover some biomarkers. And so over the last two years, we really start to pressure test the platform. We've done about 90 different projects, over 1,000 samples across 25 different tumor types. Um, about three publications have come out on the platform, really informing us around what this platform can do when we think about biomarker studies. And so today, we're going to focus on two different studies. The first one's going to be on melanoma. The second one will be on breast cancer. And the first study we'll emphasize is the ability to look at RNA at relatively high plex uh, in melanoma samples and trying to think about how do we do that and what kind of biomarkers are we likely to find. The second study will look at the combination of looking at RNA and protein, and it's one of the largest studies we've done so far with about over 150 tissue sections processed to be able to get the right amount of statistical power to be able to see patterns, if you will. And so with that, it's my pleasure to invite our first speaker, John McPherson from UC Davis, who's going to present on our ability to look at high plaque spatial RNA profiling in melanoma samples. John? Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. One question I didn't ask is this, is this the screen you're recording if I point? That one? Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for Nanostring for the opportunity to uh, talk about our collaboration. Um, skip that. Uh, some acknowledgments. I have, unfortunately, no financial conflicts to uh, reveal. Uh, I want to thank uh, Margaret, Michelle, and, and Jamie from Nanostring for this collaboration, and in particular, I want to give a shout out to uh, Maya Karu, uh, who is our, a derma, uh, dermatopathologist at UC Davis who is collaborating with this work on me. Really driven by her. So like all cancers, uh, cancer, like all cancers, melanoma is, uh, you know, early detection is one of the keys. So this, this, these are survival curves. Uh, as the curve goes down, people are dying more quickly. Uh, if you haven't seen these, in the top line here, this is uh, stage one all the way down through stage four. So they're doing, they're doing more poorly. And one of the problems is that we all have common nevi or moles. Uh, you've all got funny looking moles. You wonder, you should, should you get that looked at? Yes, you should. Uh, these are uh, often just a regular mole. Sometimes they're, they mimic melanoma. They're also precursors and they're risk markers for melanoma as well. But the diagnostic, there can be as much as a 25% uh, disagreement in the diagnos diagnosis whether it's malignant or not. And so what we're trying to do, point at that one. Ah, sorry, I have to point on this side. Uh, what we want to do is uh, find markers then that we can differentiate better whether it's uh, a malignant or non-malignant. So there are, the idea then, of course, is diagnosis, uh, prognosis, and how well your, your course of diseases go. And also, if we, the key is to find some more uh, targets for therapy. So one of the problems with uh, looking at melanoma is these are typically small samples, especially we're looking at early stage is what we're interested in. They're very heterogeneous, as you can see here. There are the, the different regions that we are interested in. Uh, we grind this up, and they're small, even that's a difficult challenge. We can grind it up, and we can get some information on it, but we lose all this spatial information. And so that's why the, the geomics platform really appealed to us, and we were fortunate enough to have a collaboration with uh, Nanostring to do this work. So Maya was able to log on to the instrument, as they said, so we don't have the instrument. It was at uh, Nanostring, so she was able to log on. Uh, these, this is the H&E section. She was able to mark it up with the regions of interest that we are interested in. These are about 200 micron circles. And then combined with the IHC, we could, uh, we could categorize these regions, and we categorize them as follows. So there's immune-rich regions, uh, melanocyte-rich, epidermis, and also a controlled epidermis at the tissue edge, and then sort of a mixed phenotype that had multiple things going on. And these are the markers here. This is just for DNA content. 
Uh, these are melanocyte markers, and then uh, you've got your immune infiltrates. So since this was a new platform and we hadn't worked with it, we were very interested in, in validation of it and how well it performs. Uh, so we went uh, on four samples here from four different patients, which is a common mole, a dysplastic nevus, a melanoma in situ, and melanoma. And with these four patients, we wanted to look at, uh, this is the early panel with 108 genes. Uh, and this is, a lot of these are the IO that uh, was described uh, previously. Um, and then we wanted to look at the replicates. So we had replicates which were serial sections. So it's the same region of interest on multiple sections, uh, on adjacent sections. And then also, because this was a, a sequencing output, where they have to, there's a small PCR step and getting prepped for the sequencing. We wanted to make sure that if we split that, that we get the same result. So just as an overview, there were 48 regions that Maya, Maya chose. Uh, one was a negative control. This is completely off the, the tissue section, just on the slide. Uh, and then these other regions of interest within these samples. Uh, each one then was done a replicate across sections, and each of those was split uh, for processing. So 192 samples total. And this shows the sequence depth across them. So the, the blue stars here indicate the, the control that was not on the tissue. And so as you expect, there's very few uh, uh, tags in those regions. Um, then there was uh, some regions that whenever you do pooling experiments and sequencing, you always see this, where there's some regions that drop out, just didn't get well represented. And out of the 96 uh, ROIs that we looked at, only one of them did both of the PCR replicates fail, so we had no data on that, so it's the one indicated by the star. So that was uh, a quite good success rate on uh, looking at those regions. And then, of course, the next thing you want to know is how well did they perform. So with the, the replicates, we were able to do a, a plot here and show, I, I, don't, I meant to make this a little bigger, but the, the R squared here is uh, 0.98 on each of these. Uh, and so this is then looking at the two replicates from serial sections. So that's very good that they, they correlate with each other. This is the gene level. And then we also want to know about the PCR replicates. This is looking at the, the probes themselves uh, that are the 1,048 probes. Uh, plotted in the same manner, and you can see the R squared here is 0.97. So we're really satisfied that uh, the data we're getting is reproducible, uh, and that we, you know, we move forward. Also, uh, as was pointed out, we uh, we could look then at these regions. So these are were stained with IHC with those markers, and we could look then at the genes that were identified. And in here, we're looking at the, these two markers, which are for melanocytes, and we see genes that are associated with uh, melanocytes that carry uh, uh, keratin, for example, uh, that the, the more staining you have here, the more we saw these things. So this correlated. Also, the immune gene counts, uh, these are regions that stain uh, with CD3, and as we expect, we see other uh, immune-type markers in those regions and not in the regions that didn't stain as much. Uh, and so again, we were satisfied that what we were detecting on it was reproducible, but it seemed to correlate then with, then with the markers that we use for the IHC. So satisfied with, with that, we uh, went on to a, the phase two of it. In this, we had those same, same four classes of the mold, and the dysplastic nevus, uh, melanoma, situ, and melanoma, and we had three patients, uh, samples from three different patients in each of these. Uh, we didn't dispense with the replicates now and just uh, also use an expanded panel. This is uh, one that has uh, over 1,400 genes and 5,000 probes, so this was an NGS readout. The sample characteristics are here. Um, they're, just to show you, that's fairly balanced, uh, male and female and age-wise. The, uh, as these melanomas are early, uh, here they are, early uh, stage, as uh, so we're really interested in. Uh, of course, the, the region of the body they come from tends to be a little more sun exposed than the melanoma, so that's the only real uh, difference between the samples. So we had all the data that was produced from the sequencing, all the expression data, and we clustered that. Uh, and we were quite pleased that at least they cr clustered it initially, it looks like, by region, uh, the, or the type of region that we had, and within those regions, they, they cluster fairly well with uh, whether the melanomas, which are in orange here, for example, uh, would cluster together. And so we felt that because of this clustering, it gave us some confidence that there's probably a signature there uh, that we could uh, mine out and use uh, for prognosis or diagnosis. So we, the panel was one that they had prepared, and, and fortunately, there were about half of the genes that we would, if we had a pr preferred list for melanoma, about half of them were on there. Uh, so we wanted to look at those and, and uh, see how they validated. And then we wanted to compare the extreme case classes, so the, the normal mole to a, a melanoma, and see what we could identify there. Now, there is already uh, a number of markers that are used in, uh, in melanoma. This is one is PREM, uh, preferentially expressed antigen melanoma. Uh, it's done, the assay in this case is done with a, essentially a little piece of tape, which pulls off the top cell layer uh, off the melanoma, and then using a QRT-PCR, 
uh, we can, it, you can identify the prime which is associated with melanoma. Uh, and, uh, but even in this case, this study that was done, oops, I back up. I'll try. Yes. Um, if uh, it, in this study, uh, there's still a diagnosis of the pathologist in this study disagreed 11% of the time, uh, which had a sensitivity of 91%. So markers are going to be really important in, in diagnosing melanoma early. So we look for PRAME in our data set. Uh, these, these are all plotted relative to the, the fold change to the nevi, or the, the normal mole. Uh, and in the melanocytes in the melanoma, you can see that PRAME was uh, overexpressed here, and so we are quite confident that uh, what we're looking at is probably real, because we see what we expect, which is always nice. Uh, there are genes that are commonly lost in melanoma, and we saw that down here, for example, they are underrepresented. Uh, again, that, that gives us some confidence in the results. Uh, and then uh, we're also looking, since we had the immune-rich regions, as you'd expect in the immune-rich regions, you see a lot of uh, immune-related genes being expressed at a high level. But we also saw many of these genes being expressed in the, in the melanocyte regions of the, of the melanoma. And so this, the, this could represent the immune infiltration, and so we're very interested in that. So just in summary, then, uh, the phase one and two results really, uh, I think, validated the platform in our mind that uh, what we're seeing is good technical performance. I do want to point out this is on FFPE tissue, which is uh, the, the currency of pathology, unfortunately, for me. Uh, but uh, that we have to work with these samples, so this was a great way of looking at it, and it was also these low cellularity and uh, very heterogeneous samples. Uh, we had identified the, the known markers, as uh, we expect, and, and things seemed to cluster. Uh, with uh, in the various uh, classifications that we had, and with this great uh, clustering, we really think that there are going to be some expression profiles that we can get out of this. So what are the future directions? We're still analyzing the data. There's sort of a, a, a ton of data that came out of this. And the first thing is then uh, looking for in those samples now for, for biomarkers that can distinguish between the different uh, classes there, uh, and whether there are some that we can uh, take to, to, to more samples and look without uh, patient outcomes and look to see if any of those are, are prognostic. And then we're also interested in looking at different regions, uh, and especially in particular the immune infiltrates uh, with, across the, the sample and whether they're correlating and whether there's anything we can target there. And that's it. Thank you. For a second, John? Okay. Any questions for John? Oh, now we can do that after. I'll take the question. Thank you. If you have a question, just wait for the mic so that people in the line can hear. So I had a question for you, John. I know the first study that we did, we really focused on RNA. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really do a lot of protein spatial profiling. Is it because in this particular area, RNA actually provides the information you're looking for and the protein doesn't? Or do you see va what's the value you see on the protein side? Uh, the protein would be very interesting. I, I think when we first started talking about the project, we decided to focus on the RNA side of things. And that's when we got the expanded panel uh, was the ultimate goal. Um, but I think it would be great to combine both. Uh, there's limited sample uh, material here, so since you're doing serial sections with the protein and the RNA, uh, we wanted to sort of reserve some of the sections as well. So we just stuck with the RNA because we figured that that would hopefully give us the markers we're looking for. I see. And then what information do you think the protein will reveal that the RNA is not revealing right now? Well, that, that, again, uh, that, that the RNA expression doesn't necessarily equate to protein levels. Uh, and there's many examples of that. And so I think that even if we see something in the RNA that's upregulated, you do want to eventually see whether that protein is also upregulated or not, I right? Because it could be under a different sort of control. So um, I think they're, they're both hand in hand, but um, we can do a much broader view in the RNA, right? You can look at many more targets than you can mm -hmm. typically right. with a protein. Uh, and so that's the advantage to us was that we could go broader on that first pass. Uh, and then if we see something, we can confirm it in the protein level. I see. And then the last question I had, and then I'll open it up to the other folks as well, is you mentioned the samples had low cellularity. And so these th types of samples, you would essentially lose them in bulk analysis. Yeah, so the, the, especially the early tumors, they tend to be right on the surface, they're mm -hmm. very thin. Uh, and so when you take the, you cut the sample out, it's just really that top layer you want to look at. You've got this bulk tumor. Mm -hmm. And you saw on those H&Es that there was a lot of, you know, uh, basal tissue and, and epidermis there that uh, is not gonna is gonna mask your signal and I've done a lot of work on pancreas cancer and the same thing that the, the amount of tumor compared to the mass of the tumor is quite small so that's the the, the, the difference here is that there is I a see. small um, uh, amount of tumor now you could cut that off you know you could macro dissect but then you don't you have, have much LCM material like yeah that. we did a lot of LCM but you don't get a lot of material there uh, and especially in RNA, it's difficult to, to do that with and get oh, good quality RNA out. Okay. So this was, to do it in situ on the slide was seemed to, to be the best approach for us. Excellent. Great. Any other questions for John? 
If not, thank you. Thanks so much, John.